This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. From Microbe TV, this is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 162, recorded on October 12, 2017. This episode is brought to you by the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, part of the U.S. Department of Defense, the agency's Chemical and Biological Technologies Department, hosts the 2017 Chemical and Biological Defense Science and Technology Conference to exchange information on the latest and most dynamic developments for countering chemical and biological weapons of mass destruction. Find out more at cbdstconference.com. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Well, hello there. How are you? Hey, how are you? I'm doing Okay. Yeah, we we had a little hiatus there, but we're back. Also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. Welcome. Thank and you. from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. And there we have it, the TWIM team all here today. And today we have a snippet, we have a paper, and we have uh, some email for your listening pleasure. And the snippet today was suggested some time ago by a listener named Hannah. And she wrote, Dear Twim Hosts and Associated Microbiomes. (laughs) 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 We came across this heartbreaking News and Views article in Nature yesterday and thought it would be worth talking about on Twim. And she sent a link to that and the paper, which we will discuss today. And she gives a lovely summary. In short, it's about the aptly named chytrid fungus, Batrachochytrium salamandrivorans, which has in just a few short years nearly obliterated fire salamanders, salamandra salamandra, from a few regions in northern Europe. The fungal disease is 96% fatal. Salamanders are unable to develop an immune response. The spores persist in the environment for an extremely long time. Virulence has not been decreasing over time, and there are several European reservoir hosts. The only good news is that the fungus is a relatively new arrival and hasn't spread far yet, but judging by this paper, the prognosis is grim. I think this is... In the paper, they call it the perfect storm. Perfect storm. Mm. I think this is my first time writing to Twim, though I've written into Twiv and Twip a few times and have been listening to all three podcasts religiously for years. Uh, She writes a bit about her, which I will save till afterwards. Very interesting stuff. She's working on termites. Uh, But let's uh, first talk about this very interesting paper, which was published in Nature as a letter. It's called Drivers of Salamander Extirpation, mediated by Batrachochytrium salamandrivorans and the first uh, the first two authors equally contributed Guy Stegen and Frank Pasmans the last author is Anne Martel and they're from Ghent University the University of Zurich the Swiss Ornithological Institute and the University of Brussels uh, so as Hannah said uh, the the culprit here is a fungus a chytrid fungus so this is this is a member of the phylum Chytridiomycota. These are considered the oldest types of fungi that we know about. And over a thousand different chytrid fungi that live mostly in water or moist environments. And you may have heard about chytrid fungi because they're also wreaking havoc on frogs globally and causing mass extinctions. Now, in this uh, paper, we're talking about a uh, chytrid bee. Uh, salamandrivorans, which been around for a while, originated in Asia many, many, many years ago, but seems to have been transported to Europe with salamanders uh, as part of the pet trade. Oh, my. So Asian salamanders have, you know, this was many, many millions of years old. So Asian salamanders have become resistant to the fungus. 
you know, in other parts of the world, the salamanders have never seen it. When it was introduced into Europe, the, the fungus that is, it, it spread like crazy and wiping them out. And that's what happens when you put a pathogen into a new population that's never seen it before. You know, we've seen this happen with viruses all the time. Uh, you have problems. So the pet trade, you know, shipping sal- – people love to have salamanders. They're very attractive. Uh, but um, it's a problem. So uh, this paper it talks of – it's a very nice study. What they have done here, it was first found in um, Belgium. Well, well, I should say uh, after the first discovery of this uh, fungus in Belgium, which was April 2014, uh, they monitored the – uh, fungus and its effect on salamanders for the next two years. And part of that monitoring is part of this study. And they also do some experiments. And they show basically, they they monitor the population of the salamanders uh, and they show this incredible decrease in populations. And there's a figure which shows that uh, where the number of fungi from 2014 to 2015 has hugely declined after the introduction of this fungus. They do a ser- then they do a series of infection experiments. You can grow these salamanders in the laboratory. You can grow the fungus, of course, and you can infect and see what happens. Uh, but And basically in the laboratory, uh, this infection uh, in this species, Salamandra salamandris, is that it? Uh, what is, uh, that, it's close. It's almost, it's 100% lethal. What I found striking about that, too, is it wasn't dependent on just a high dose of infection. Even if they did a very low dose infection, yeah. it took longer, but still... It killed them. You know, 95% death, yeah. And Even are, at different temperatures. They tried to give the salamander every chance yeah. to fight back, and they couldn't. Uh, these are fire salamanders, by the way. So, and, and also, the lethality is independent of temperature. So the optimum growth temperature for the fungus is 15 Celsius. If you infect at four Celsius, it takes longer, but it eventually will kill them as well. Uh, And here's the thing that is very scary. If any salamander survives the infection, they are not immune. They can be killed again by reinfecting them. So there doesn't seem to be any immunity built up against uh, this fungus. Now, salamanders do have innate immune systems, but uh, apparently they don't have what it takes to... um, Fight they need the, they need their they need good god fearing T cells <laughs> in yeah. order to 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 get rid Take of this of the fungus yeah and maybe that's the problem here now the reason why this fungus is wiping out the population is because it kills it disproportionately infects sexually mature animals so you get rid of all the salamanders that can give rise to new salamanders and of course the population disappears now, older animals who don't reproduce anymore are less susceptible, but that doesn't matter. Eventually they're going to die anyway. So this is a real problem. They have a photo here of two salamanders mating. And, you know, this fungus causes uh, skin lesions. And, uh, you know, when they mate, they transfer the fungus to one another. And um, that's what happens. Uh, that's how it's transferred. And this fungus is has not shown any decrease in virulence over the time of the outbreak in Europe. And it makes environmentally resistant spores. So typically these, this, this fungus makes modal spores, which are not as resistant and they, they can be transmitted by aerosols, but they also make what they call an infectious insisted spore, which is incredibly resistant. The other spores, the, um, the uh, modile spores can swim and that may be how they get to their hosts, but they're not very stable. These, these, Insisted spores uh, are, are extremely stable in the, in the environment, uh, and uh, they last for long periods of time. And in fact, in this, uh, in this uh, experiment, they lasted at least 31 days in pond water. And they're floating on the water-air interface. And That's if you right. think about the life history of a salamander, it's got to go into the water. And so as it breaks that surface, it's obvious that the salamander has to encounter those insisted spores. And so even though it's a different mode of transmission, if you will, it's as efficient because of the life history of the animal that mm-hmm. the spore is infecting. It's, it's a really remarkable adaptation 
of that insisted spore. The spores also mm-hmm. stick to the skin. Oh yeah. Of the salamander. And they also stick to uh, the feet of water birds. So they can be transmitted, you know, longer distances as the birds move around. It's amazing, really. <laughs> this yeah. reminded me a lot of how influenza moves so rapidly around the globe yeah. with birds. with uh, birds. And the other parallel I drew as I was reading this is how influenza is so universally lethal to a naive population that doesn't have any inherent or intrinsic mm-hmm. immunity to it. So in many ways, if you're thinking about it, this is a pandemic that is affecting the salamanders of Europe. Yep, absolutely. Michelle, you were going to comment. Yeah, these little spores are also more tolerant to um, prey in the water. So zooplankton that could mm-hmm. would normally feed on spores, they, they can tolerate that as well. So, boy, I just don't know how what methods we can use to get this under control. It's going to be tough. They also looked at two other hosts of this fungus. Toads, for example, can be infected. They don't show signs of disease, but they can transmit the fungus to salamanders. So they can actually infect them in the laboratory. In fact, the toads in the laboratory mix them with the salamanders. They'll transmit infection. Uh, in addition, newts, alpine newts, which occur in the in the environment with fire salamanders. Uh, they get disease and death at a high dose, but in low doses, they survive and they can transmit the the fungus to the salamanders as well. So the newts also could be a a pathogen reservoir. In addition, the fungus is in forest soil. They show that they can transmit the infection to salamanders via contaminated forest soil. And the, the contamination of the soil occurs from the newts. The newts are infected. They shed it into the soil, and they found fungal DNA after 200 days in forest soil. And so they write, the presence of a resistant spore with the ability to persist environmentally, transmit through contaminated water and soil, combined with long-term infected and pathogen-shedding amphibian hosts, creates the potential for extensive environmental reservoirs and hampers any effort to eradicate the fungus from an infected ecosystem. Mm. No options to halt the spread. Uh, in, in any way. Now, we should point out that many parts of the world are free of this chytrid fungus, like the Americas, but who knows? We, lo- <laughs> we love to import pets, especially exotic pets. So it's, you know, if someone brings in the wrong salamander, uh, this could introduce it here, because we certainly have salamanders here. So I don't know what you do about that, uh, you know. You gotta, you have to have uh, rules, but people always break the rules and bring in things when they're not supposed to. So uh, it may be just a matter of time before it reaches uh, the Americas. So it begs the question: How are the Asian salamanders resistant? Yeah, that's a good question, and that should mm. be that should be studied. And obviously, that's something that happened over many many years. You know, they point out here that over this two year period in Europe, the fungus has not decreased in virulence for the salamanders, but it's probably too soon. Yeah. uh, Right. It takes a lot longer for these things to occur. You know, the, both the fungus and the host probably co-evolve so that they both persist. But of course, if the fungus wipes out all of the hosts, it's the end of the fungus too. Right. So you have to, but it can survive as a dormant spore for so long. It just seems like the odds are it can still come roaring back. if The host comes along. That could very well be. Sure. So it's not a good story, as uh, Hannah points out. And, no, it's a bad uh, story. story. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, probably doing research on this fungus and this salamander is not very easy to do and not very easy to get funded, right? You, no. You can imagine that people are, who cares about a salamander, right? Let's worry about people. But here, um, salamanders are part of the ecosystem. Well, in many, re- many ways, it's very reminiscent of how HIV wreaked havoc on the human population. And unfortunately, uh, salamanders don't have pharmaceutical companies working for them That's right. to, to try to eradicate this. And, you know, HIV wreaks havoc because it destroys the immune system. And the poor salamander, it appears, doesn't have a sufficient immune response in order to combat this disease or force uh, natural selection 
on itself as well as the fungus to adapt. And yeah, having 100% lethality is bad because that means no one's left who might be even partially resistant to carry on, right? Yeah, and the the reason HIV can persist is because it's such a slow acting death, but this is the opposite of that. It's pretty fast. Go ahead, Michelle. Uh, yeah, I, I really appreciated this paper in that um, it's a great way to learn some of the basic principles of pathogenesis. Mm -hmm. um, they talked about um, what makes the perfect pathogen, and and um, you know, for example, its ability to affect infect the um, reproductive age host drives the population dynamics, et cetera. So I recommend the paper as a, a, a teaching vehicle. So Michelle, that was the question I was going to ask of you since you have the fresh freshmen. Did, are you going to share with them the, the, the nature summary or are you going to ask them to dig into the paper? Because I think freshmen would just love the salamander story. Yeah. So, of course, I wrote my syllabus and chose um, papers and podcasts uh, several months ago. So I would have to rearrange my syllabus to include this, but I'll keep it in mind for next, next year. Next year, you bet. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Leo, the bottom line is that the uh, there's reservoir host for the fungus in Europe. There's 100% lethality. And it's not yet here in the Americas, this uh, fungus. And so. And it can persist in water and soil for a very long time. Mm -hmm. It's pretty grim for the salamanders, especially if it comes to the if the fungus came to the Americas it, via the pet trade, uh, this would be a problem. And the fungus got really clever and makes two variants of spores, both of which attack the life history of the animal. I guess the good I guess the good news is that Asian salamanders are resistant or, or, or don't don't all die. So there is some hope that in in time uh, maybe European salamanders would. Become the same. And the biggest danger is that it can be spread by birds. So a duck or a waterfowl lands in the pond where the fungus happens to be floating on the surface, and it can the spore can literally attach itself to the bird who flies away and lands in a different pond, and you literally have the fungal spread independent of the salamander. All right. right. All right. That, thank you, Hannah, for that. I will uh, get back to Hannah's email uh, later on when we do some email because she tells us some interesting things. In the meantime, I want to take a short break and tell you about uh, the sponsor of this episode, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Imagine an everyday inexpensive drone you could buy online modified by terrorists to spread by chemical or biological weapons over a crowded football stadium or a holiday parade. Plague, VX, sarin, weaponized flu. How could we prevent a scenario like this happening? How would we treat the victims? What could we do to counteract the effects? Well, for answers to some of these questions, join us in Long Beach, California, November 28th through 30th for the 2017 Chemical and Biological Defense Science and Technology Conference to examine information on the latest and most dynamic developments for countering chemical and biological weapons of mass destruction. Collaborate with over 1,500 scientists, subject matter experts, military service members, industry partners, and academic leaders from across the globe who are committed to making the world safer by confronting chem bio defense challenges. Part of the U.S. Department of Defense and charged with safeguarding our warfighters and our nation, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency's Chemical and Biological Technologies Department hosts this important conference and brings together the best and brightest from around the world. Please join us to share important ideas. For more information uh, and to register for this conference, you can go to cbdstconference.com and you can also get updates uh, on Twitter or Facebook. On Twitter, it's CBDST Conference, and on Facebook, just search for DODDTRA. The 2017 CBDST Conference, today's innovation, tomorrow's warfighter capabilities. And now we will hear uh, from Elio about a very different but nonetheless, very interesting subject. Yeah, I don't know that there is a, much of a connection, except that we're talking <laughs> about pathogens and hosts. <laughs> and in this case, I'm going to talk about chlamydia. And the reason I picked on chlamydia is because there is a slight paradox. Uh, practically everybody has heard of chlamydia. They cause the most common sexually transmitted disease. Uh, so who hasn't heard of it? And that's true, not just for the general public, but for microbiology. On the other hand, most microbiologists 
and probably most of the public don't know the rest of the story, which is that chlamydia are not just human pathogens, but are um, not necessarily pathogens, but are associated with a huge variety of animals and plants. In fact, you can hide, they, they seem to be ubiquitous and they do not cause disease except in some species like humans. They are all over the place, okay? So that the view that chlamydia are sexually transmitted diseases and that's that is very narrow and inappropriate. Now, uh, I'm going to end up someplace else, namely the <laughs> chlamydia have been found to have the genes for flagella, like bacteria flagella, they seem to be very much the same as the flagella, flagella genes are found in other bacteria. So, what's the story? Why would a strict intracellular parasite, I didn't say that, but the chlamydia like rickettsia and a number of other organisms are strict intracellular parasites that cannot grow outside of cells on agar plates or someplace like that. So, why would an, a beast which is destined to live inside the cell be mortal? I don't have the answer, but that's where we're going. Let me start out though, with chlamydia. So um, they, as I say, they are all over. And in addition, what, what is known about it is limited because proving postpostulates is not always easy, as Michael always points out. This is not an easy thing to do. And um, so we don't know a great deal about most of the chlamydia in the world. There is one the, uh, called chlamydophila pneumonia, which used to be called chlamydia pneumonia, which causes pneumonia, and is said not just to cause pneumonia, but to be associated, who knows how, with such diseases as atherosclerosis, asthma, and Alzheimer's, and you name it. So this chlamydia has been associated with all kinds of other diseases. So that, what I'm saying is chlamydia matter. They're interesting, okay. They undergo a complex life cycle. They have sort of an extracellular component called the elementary body, which is like a, if you want to, like a spore in the sense that it's environmentally very tough, and a stage inside of cells where it expands, gets quite a bit bigger, and then it's called the reticulate body. Anyhow, they tend to be to have small genomes. Uh, some are larger than one uh, one, one million bases, but most of them are about one million bases, and they lack a lot of genes for survival, such as for amino acid biosynthesis and making nucleotides. They do not make their own energy. They acquire it readily. They have ADP, ATP translocases, so they can import it. So, Elio, anyhow. can I ask you, do they, yes. give, do they provide anything for the cell in which they reside? Aha. Mm. Uh -huh. Interesting. That's a phenomenal question. The answer is I have no idea. The <laughs> traditional way of thinking about them is they're the ultimate parasite. Okay. And parasites traditionally don't actually confer any benefit that human beings have figured out. Mm. But so, there's got well, to be something. Because they say in the, in the abstract, chlamydia uh, are obligate intracellular bacteria comprising important human pathogens and symbionts of protists. Yes. So maybe in the and protists, they are, they are, symb they are endosymbionts. They right? are seen as symbionts only because they don't seem to cause any disease and are found in abundance in many, many protists. Okay. So symbiont here is defined as it's there. Yeah. What okay. it does, what good it does, I haven't run, I haven't run into it. Okay. I mean, maybe somebody knows, but I don't. Right. However, let me go into something quite different and which is surprising, namely that chlamydia are said to have participated in the establishment of plastids, of chloroplasts in plants. Okay? There is uh, the reason for saying that is because they have proteins which are remarkably like those of both cyanobacteria, which are the supposed to be the ancestors of the plastids, bacteria which became plastids, just like rickettsia became mitochondria, and of plants themselves. So, and then they have some characteristics which are really typical of uh, the plastids and not of bacteria, like having a 23S ribosomal RNA intron. For those who know what that means, it's a signature that is characteristic of uh, lower eukaryotes, archaea, but is in, in algal plastids, but is present, is absent in most bacteria. 
The question is, are chlamydia motile? So this recent paper that we have that we're discussing, and the paper is by Kolingro, Kölstbacher, Kölstbacher, Musman, Stepanaukas, Hallam, and Horn. And these are folks from uh, the University of Vienna, University of British Columbia, that's it, from different units in the University of British Columbia. So what they find is that chlamydia have genes which are practically the same as the genes that code for bacterial flagella. Okay, so that is a good question. Why they have it? Why would they have that? And I have I don't nobody knows. This is all genomics, by the way. And these are it's these all are these finding are, genes. These are marine chlamydia, right? Yeah, that's right. It's nice for you to point it out. These are not this is not found throughout the world of chlamydia. It is found in marine chlamydia about which we know relatively little. So uh this is not a general attribute of all chlamydia, it doesn't seem to be, <clears throat> but they're found in three different isolates in three different parts of the world. So, And these, uh, uh, these marine chlamydia are within protists in the oceans, right? Uh, undoubtedly, but they don't know anything about it. All they know is that when they, find, when they do metagenomics, essentially, no, they do single-cell isolates of protists, that's right. Mm. They do single-cell isolates, and in it they find the genes for, okay. chlamydial genes for... Um, Motility for flagella formation. Well, uh, what else can I say? The only thing I can tell you is that there are there is an analogy in the world of different intracellular, strict intracellular parasites, namely the rickettsia. Rickettsia and chlamydia sometimes are lumped together in the minds of microbiologists, but are not. They belong to different phyla. Uh, and rickettsia, which cause diseases like typhus a variety of typhus and diseases, are also widespread in nature. And not only do they have the genes for flagella, they have flagella. And the reason you can see them, you can isolate them and see them, with the chlamydia, you have problems. You, have, you can't, in the case of the marine chlamydia that we're talking about, you can't just go and pick them and look at them and say, are they mortal or not? Nobody's done that. But in the case of rickettsia, it's possible. And when you look at rickettsia, they are mortal they are actually motor, and they're motor only inside of cells. Hmm. Let me clear something up. <laughs> there is a different kind of motility in rickettsia and in other organisms like Listeria and Shigella, which have, besides having flagella, are capable of moving inside of cells by push, being pushed around by actin mm -hmm. filaments. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. This is another story. Okay. So they 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 move around that way, and apparently they go from cell to adjacent cell that way. There seems to be a mechanism for transferring from one cell to another. Here without we're talking being about exposed system. without being exposed to the immune system through those actin rockets, and that's the beauty of that type of motility inside a cell. That's right. Uh, these guys, the rickettsia here, move in a different way. They move by flagella, by flagella motility, inside of cells. And in one case, they move around the nucleus of the cell, sort of in a circular motion. In another, they move in the cytoplasm in a linear motion. The interesting part is that if you squish, if you squash around the cell and release the rickettsia, they stop moving. Mm. This is peculiar. Mm. So anyhow, and I, the reason I make that point is because in the case of chlamydia, you could make the following case that in outside of cells, chlamydia need to find their host. Well, one way to find their host is by having motility. And nobody has shown yet that the chlamydia can do this outside of cells. But it's plausible. Unlike the catsia, which stop moving when they are outside of cells, here the chlamydia possibly can move in the environment and move from cell to cell and find new hosts that way. So we don't know a great deal about it yet, but this is a peculiar situation, and I think it was worth, worth discussing. Do we actually know that the flagellar proteins are made in the chlamydia? Or is it just no, that the DNA? So it could be that no, the DNA is there, right? No, purely genomics. Mm. So it could be that there are actually no flagella on the surface of chlamydia. Someone needs to look, right? Or the chlamydia flagella genes are morphing into the type 3 secretion system. They did comment ah. on, on that, 
that yes. um, notably they contain orthologs for both the flagella system and the NFT3 secretion system. So mm. it could be point. very similar to type 3 secretion, which makes a lot more sense for mm-hmm. an intracellular parasite. Yeah. But, but, but as a counterpoint, I believe yes. they also found genes for uh, chemosensing, that which too. many right. modal organisms use to mm. decide not just to swim, but where to swim. So Thank for making that, that point. That's actually right. Yeah, that would suggest that it's a functional conservation. And, yeah, and the point, the point that we made is that if you find sets of whole sets of genes in an organism like chlamydia, it's likely to be important because these have reduced genomes. They don't have enough of a genome to make it in the environment, leave alone carry extra genes. Mm. So because of the parsimony of these organisms, finding a set of genes suggests function. Of course, the experiment still has to be done where someone looks for the flagellar proteins, right? Exactly. But it's really tricky because, as Elio said, um, the way they got these samples in the first place is they went to different Mm. um, locations, Vancouver Island, um, I forget where the other one was, got water, and then they they used high-tech methods to separate into single-cell pools and then amplified from a single cell. So, so the idea of, um, you know, doing experiments to look at flagellar proteins, like that's, they yeah. need to culture the organism yeah, first they, or. Yeah. They probably don't have cultures at all. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, the reason. Yeah. Was, so, and this extends in a way our view of, um, of, uh, parasitism is a strict intercellular parasitism. So it, it, what, what I'm saying is, I always thought of chlamydia and rickettsia being something like a virus in the sense that it only grows and lives and thrives inside of cells. But maybe it does something like motility outside of cells. That's the point that I think is worth Could be. at least considering. But the rickettsia do not move. No, they rickettsia have no do energy. not move. They That's have right. No it doesn't, go, doesn't hold for rickettsia. And so maybe there are two different rules. These are very different yeah. organisms after all. So my, my, I have a little skepticism because uh, from a, my view of viruses inside of cells, viruses always move in cells along uh, cytoskeletal elements, either naked or within vesicles, because the cytoplasm of a eukaryotic cell is incredibly crowded. So mm. I don't know how a rickettsia would move around with the flagellum unless it were hooked onto an actin my, you know, filament. Let me say well, something about that. I, I used to look, uh, when I was younger, yeah. and I had been drafted into the army, one of the jobs I was given is to look at the cells infected with the calcium. And although cells are, uh, these were cells in culture, okay, fibroblasts, were very flat, and the cytoplasm is, looks very crowded around the nucleus. That's where all the mitochondria are, probably endoplasmic reticulum, who knows what else. Outside, there's sort of a, the cells spread out, and they look quite empty. Not many mitochondria there, and so rickettsia can, could move around there with no problem at all. Yeah, but there are things you can't see under light microscopy, like oh, sure. ribosomes sure. and filaments and vesicles of various sorts. I mean, yeah, uh, I, this illustrator, uh, Ed, uh, Edward Goodsell, has drawn images of cells. In fact, in, in our textbook of virology, we have a lovely one showing that it's just hard to move around. It's packed in the cytoplasm. And, you know, we used to think that viruses diffused through the cytoplasm, but that can't be. They have to be motored around. And, you know, whether I think this rickettsia just can't swim around by itself, even if it had flagella, it would have to be attached to a to a cytoskeletal element. But then why would it stop moving when it's outside of the cell? So. Well, as they speculate in the second to last paragraph of their paper, they point out that the flagella just may be something to stick to to particles in the marine environment. Could be, sure. They've lost the motility function, and it's simply another means for them to move from cell to cell. Could be. That's right. Flagella are involved in signaling. Yeah. And sickening and function as well. As Michelle brought up, we have to remember they also have the genes for chemotaxis and they can chemically sense the environment that they're in. So I I think the expression experiment to see whether or not these things actually express the flagella gene on the surface is is really the cool thing that could come from this to see if, Mm. you know, it's able to 
express it when they detect a chemical gradient change and say, hey, things are good. I can move to a new house. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, uh-huh. that, that would make sense. Yep. Sure. And the now, authors suggest that during their extracellular life out in the water, they may rely on glycogen, so a storage compound, oh, yes. um, to drive the flagella, flagella. And then once they get inside a cell, they can just start feeding off of host um, goodies. So, Well, I think the one of the things that the paper tells me is that you can find out a tremendous amount from genomics, which here is the finding of the genes for flagella. But that to figure out what these genes are doing and how they work, you really have to have the cells, the organisms themselves. That mm-hmm. genomics can only take you so, so far. Sure. The different, but it is the a, it's here, a neat way. It's a neat way to look deep into the family tree because they found some of, of the um, ancient ancestors of, of the all the chlamydia that we think about. And it, apparently they arose from an ancestor that did have flagella. That's the easiest explanation. Well, I think it's a good way of asking questions. It, it points mm-hmm. towards... Like all of metagenomics, tells you what questions to ask. Yeah, for sure. Anyhow, I, I had a good, I had a good time with this because I I got to love chlamydia. <laughs> it's very interesting <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Fancy that! I was able to, I was able to communicate. I can't say with that I had a personal experience with them, but. <laughs> 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 Too much information. Too much information. I was, able, I was able to communicate with Astrid Kalingro today, what the first author. She was very generous in communicating with me when I didn't give her much of a lead time. But I can tell you that she grew up in a small town in Bavaria, Germany. And then she studied microbiology at the Technical University of Munich. And there she did a diploma thesis on uh, the influence of facultative and obligate symbionts of acanthamoeba species on their host. So she's been interested in these intracellular um, microbes for some time. She started her PhD also in Munich, and then she went with uh, Michael Wagner and uh, Matthias Horn, her um, the senior author on this paper, to the University of Vienna. She got her degree there as a microbial ecologist, studying um, the infection and genome analysis of these chlamydia symbionts of amoeba. Since then, she's been doing this comparative genome analysis and their evolution, but she's also interested in chlamydia diversity and their role in the environment. And she also studies some other host microbe interactions in the lab. Um, She said it was really exciting the first time they looked into this um, uh, genome sequence and found the flagellar genes and found not just one or two, but some 20 or more genes to make up the apparatus. And that kind of set her on the path for this paper. Apart from her science, um, she and her husband have three daughters between the ages of six and 12. And when she's not working, she likes to be outside with her family in nature, enjoying hiking and mountain biking. Mm. Hopefully watching out for the uh, chytrid fungi. Where did you say she is? Yeah. Um, well, they are in Vienna now. Okay. No f- mm. maybe Which, no f- by the way, is a hotbed of uh, very good work in environmental microbiology these days. Yeah. Well, Something and they clearly new. have some... Uh, a lot of technology um, that they would have had to draw on for this single cell genome analysis. Great. Thank you, Michelle. Hmm? Let me read a few emails and let me uh, resume Hannah's email. If you recall, Hannah had sent us the salamander paper. Uh, A bit about me, she writes. I'm a Canadian biology master's student studying at the Free University of Berlin And although I'm not doing microbiology per se, I've been working with eastern subterranean termites, reticulitermes flavipes, and the entomopathogenic fungus Metarhizium anisopliae, focusing on the mechanisms that termites use to protect their colonies from fungal infection. For decades, people have tried to use this fungus to control subterranean termites, but because termites are amazing and have something called social immunity, It hasn't worked. Maybe the termites need to talk to the salamanders. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. While I'm on this tangent, here are some more cool termite facts for a microbiology-inclined audience. Our flavipes, like other, quote, lower termites, has a specially adapted hindgut that's packed with the biggest, most beautiful flagellates you've ever seen, plus loads of bacteria, some of which live as ectosymbionts on the flagellates and propel them around. Wow. Can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> bugs within bugs within bugs. So the flagellates, the bacteria are sticking to the flagellates, and that's how the bacteria get around. 
So there's Boy. a there's a connection between the two stories, Ailey. <laughs> <laughs> the flagellates, the, the flagellates, and to a lesser extent, the bacteria help the termite digest wood. Higher termites don't have flagellate symbionts; just plenty of bacteria. But one group, the Macrotermitinae, live in a special symbiotic relationship with another type of microbe, the fungus genus Termitomyces. They build entend fungus gardens inside their nests, a bit like leafcutter ants. We have one macrotermes species in the lab, but sadly, I have not yet found an excuse to do anything with them. They're so cool. Okay. I'll... One, one thing you could do with, with the termatomyces is eat them. They're among the most delectable fungi in uh, places where you have termite, termite colonies and, and growing up. Really? Up into the, have you ever, have, have you ever, uh, nests, but... have you ever eaten any? No, I haven't, but I read about it. Okay. Sautéed with a little butter? <laughs> Is that what you would do? You can eat anything <laughs> if you put butter on it. You can eat any fungus once, right? That's no. It. That's Elio's thing. I stole yes. that from him. All right. Okay. Uh, Hannah writes, I'll sign off now before I get even more carried away. Thanks for all your hard work. I look forward to the next episode. Then we have an email from jo Joshua Whites, who was one of the authors on a Pacer. A paper that we recently did. Dear Vincent, Michael, Michelle, and Elio, my colleagues alerted me today to the Twin Podcast on our immunophage synergy paper in cell host and microbe. Thanks for taking the time to reflect on our work. I found the conversation quite stimulating and hope our future efforts can address some of the questions raised. Just to remind everyone, this was a paper where it was found that they used phage to control pseudomonas infections in mice, and the control of the infection requires an intact immune system in the mice. So Joshua continues, at one point, the podcast raised a question on the details of the models. Given the access issues noted for cell host micro, we posted the following GitHub link on our group page. It should have all the relevant simulation code in case you are interested or know folks who want to see the details underlying the mathematical concepts. So he sends a link I'll to this. I'll get right on that. You better, yeah. I'll get right on that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think you were the one who wanted to know, Michelle. Right? <laughs> anyway, so Joshua puts a link to uh, the mathematical model information. Note that even more details on the proof of concept model are available in a related paper in the Journal of Theoretical Biology. And uh, mm -hmm. Joshua is a professor uh, at Georgia Institute of Technology and, of course, was a co-author co on that paper. So I'm glad Joshua found out. I'm always interested to hear if people end up finding out that their work has been discussed on TWIM or any of our podcasts. Now, Anthony sends a link to an interesting uh, article. Uh, it, it was published in a, on a website called National Hog Farmer, which is not something Say I read. again? National Hog Farmer. Hmm. I don't read this every day. <laughs> That's surprising given the extensive... Uh, reading list that you have for your podcast, Vincent. <laughs> Maybe I should add it. Anyway, you should add he it. sends an article entitled McDonald's Developing Species-Specific Antibiotic Use Policies. So McDonald's has a global vision for antibiotic stewardship. I didn't realize this. That's great. And their goal is to preserve antibiotic effectiveness through ethical practice. And so they have issued an update to that. Um, they will to develop specific policies and implementation timelines for suppliers, because McDonald's doesn't grow animals themselves, but they get it from suppliers who provide chicken, beef, pork, dairy products, and eggs. So they're saying, here's what you should be doing in the use of antibiotics in your animals. So that's good because they're a huge user of uh, these animals, of course. And, and the products like eggs and other things. Yeah, so it's good that they're yeah. being more responsible, right? They, along with Terrific. many of the fat, they, along with many of the other fast food giants, like in South Carolina, we have Chick Fil A, and mm -hmm. Chick Fil A mm -hmm. is actively pursuing antibiotic free chickens, and it's part of their marketing campaign. Right, and and so many many companies are practicing good antibiotic stewardship in order to try to help us preserve the antibiotics that we currently have. Good, good for McDonald's. They may have other problems, but that's good at least. Yes. All right. We have an email from Sarah who writes, hello, Twixers. I'm finally writing my first email. Only took me five years. I've been listening since 2012 when in my second year of undergraduate studies, 
at the University of Glasgow, I encountered your series of podcasts through my courses in microbiology. At this point, I was still on track for a degree in anatomy, but after being spellbound by our micro courses, I decided to change and got my degree in parasitology instead. Yay. Great. I was, of course, <laughs> further inspired by your podcast, of which, no offense to the others, TWIP remains my absolute favorite. And I quickly listened to the very long list of episodes I had missed in my ignorance. The Twix podcasts have kept me entertained on train commutes, flights home to Sweden, on holiday travels with my husband, who has endured many long and somewhat one-sided discussion on various topics. The podcasts <laughs> have not only helped teach my husband more than he ever wanted to know about worms, bacteria, and viruses, but they helped me tremendously with my studies by making lots of information more accessible and they, of course, kept up my motivation and science interest on those dark days when no experiments would work. Most recently, the podcasts have taken on a new role of keeping me more widely informed and entertained on my daily 40-minute walk to and from work. As I, in my career, focus on a na slightly more narrow topic, after getting my BSc honors and MSCI, I gained employment as a research technician in a University of Glasgow Center for Virus Research lab last November. Vincent may remember us. He was a recipient of the Stoker Prize a few years back. I wasn't there. It's ironic, but I now work on viruses, my least favorite of infectious agents. Sorry, <laughs> hey. sorry Vincent, instead of my beloved parasites, but I actually love it. Our area of research is what prompted this very lengthy first email. As Vincent mentioned, using Wolbachia endosymbionts in mosquitoes, as a potential population control strategy and a method to reduce transmission of viral diseases like Zika and Dengue. This is what we work on. I mainly spend my days in our insectary taking care of and experimenting on our many mosquitoes with all the delightful Twix hosts as company. But I also do some cell work and once in a while even a plaque assay. It's, all right. It's nice to have a cell break sometimes when you work with fussy tropical mosquitoes that must be kept at 28 degrees Celsius and 80% humidity. Vincent mm -hmm. might like the humidity, but for a northern Swedish person, it, it takes some getting used to. Anyway, sorry about the long email. I guess it's what happens when you don't write for five years. And my sincerest thanks to all of you for your excellent work and dedication to these podcasts. They really are a treat to listen to, and I recommend them to anyone who will listen, scientists or not. Sincerely, Sa Sarah from Scotland. P.S. I subscribe on all of our devices. It's dead easy, and everyone should do it, if only so that Vincent can stop pleading. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. All right. So uh, there. Thank you, Sarah. Very nice. Love to hear your stories. Uh, Anthony sends a, a number of links. He writes, Small Things Considered recently had a post on stromatolites. You know about that, Elio? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was written by a graduate student. Yeah, Jillian Belk. In the beginning, there were stromatolites. And Anthony writes, these are found in New Jersey. And he sends a link to an article, stromatolites in the Franklin Marble, New Jersey Highlands. And he says they are in central New Jersey, too, and sends a link to an article about that. And I live in central New Jersey, so that's probably uh, why he is sending it. He writes, stromatolites give us a peephole into a time billions of years ago when new developments were not McMansions, but vast tracts of mats of microorganisms. Mm, well said. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, our last email is from Mark, who writes, the true By the way, thank you, Anthony. I, I appreciate it very much. Mark writes, the true purpose of microbiology. Hello, Elio, Michelle, Michael, and Vincent. Greetings from a longtime listener from San Jose, California. The California harvest and winemaking season is underway. This Saturday, we receive and will crush a few tons of Chardonnay from Alexander Valley. I am currently buying yeast and nutrients for its primary fermentation and bacteria for secondary malolactic fermentation. The true, my, the true purpose of microbiology is to crest all those little bugs that make delicious beer, cheese, bread, and wine. Enjoy the attached picture. And he sent a photograph of um, <laughs> inoculum packages. Inoculum packages you can use to make wine, right? It's called, yeah. it's called H2S Preventing Wine Yeast. And you can get Vivace, Allegro, Andante, Mestoso, Brioso, Brio, and Ossia. You know, strains for Pinot Noir, Noir, 
uh, aromatic expression of wine variety. Ver- oh, this is just great. And Renaissance uh, yeast, they Renaissance call it. Renaissance yeast. And you can, <laughs> isn't that cool? Now it he's is. making me hungry for some bread. <laughs> I don't know. I, the Chardonnay sounds good to me. Well, that too. It's a bit early, I guess, but five o'clock I somewhere. At, I, I work in a state building, so I, I cannot hit, speculate on Chardonnay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, thank you, Mark. Good luck with your wine. Hope it works out well. Yeah, the the uh, microbes are wonderful for all these goodies. All right, that's TWIM 162. You can find it at asm.org slash TWIM. You can also find it at Apple Podcasts. Please subscribe so you get every uh, episode. Just like um, Sarah said, subscribe on all your devices. And once you do that, I will stop asking you to subscribe. If you like what we do, consider supporting us financially. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute for the different ways you can do it. And we do love hearing your questions. We love hearing your stories, how how you found us, what we mean to you, and all that. Twim at microbe.tv. Don't be shy. Michelle Swanson's at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Michelle, this morning I was driving on the New Jersey Turnpike. There was heavy traffic. The car in front of me had a sticker on the back. It was a football helmet with a big M on it. How about that? Here in New Jersey, there are Michigan fans. We're all over the place. <laughs> you sure it wasn't for Marist College? <laughs> it's a big blue M, that you know? Block M is, yeah. It's, <laughs> Marist it's is thing. red, I think. Okay. <laughs> and they don't have a very good football team, I think. My son goes you're to gonna, Marist, you know. <laughs> you're going to get letters. My son you're goes to Marist, letters. yeah, but he doesn't you're listen get- to him. Michael Schmidt is at the University, Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. Is it still warm there, Michael? 90 degrees today. Wow. Ooh. I, I'm hoping for October before November. Gee. But uh, it's, it's, it's turned into summer. We went from one beautiful week of fall to back to summer. Right. And uh, climate change is here, folks. Elio Schechter is at Small Things Considered. Thank you, Elio. My pleasure, of course. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ray Ortega for his technical help. I also want to thank the sponsor of TWIM, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. The music you hear on TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in microbiology.